I, I can see that. Yeah, there's short cycles, medium cycles, and long cycles. And I think this is a long cycle we're heading into. There are many cyclical theories of history, too. Many, many of them. Um, yeah. This is the OGM call for Thursday, November 21, 2024. It's the week before Thanksgiving in the U.S. for U.S. people. Um, and April and I are about to take a three-week trip to Australia. So uh, we board a flight this afternoon. It's going to be fun. Um, good. We've got Kevin coming in. And the topic, um, the topic I pointed toward in the invite for today's call was just some reflecting about OGM and uh, how it serves us and what we'd like to see it do with no, we've had conversations like this before, so I'm not, uh, not trying to create a new mission statement or something like that, but I'm, I'm trying to get some reflections on what works and what doesn't and what the, what some of the possibilities are, because it would be nice to do a little bit of a, a kind of mental reset. Uh, as we head into 2025, because a lot of things are going on that are going to be interesting to deal with in community. Um, Kevin is hip deep in community right now. Uh, he just sent a note to the OGM list this morning about the situation in, in and around Swannanoa, the Swannanoa River. Um, and uh, John Warner is just joining us. And John, yeah, you're you're a little bit the provocation for the topic of this call, John. You sent me a nice note saying, "Hey, so what's a uh, what's this OGM mission supposed to be?" And I was I started I started writing you, but I started writing a post because I figured why answer just you? Why not do it more publicly? And then I got stuck, of course, in that loop of well, wait a minute, what do I say? So I thought, why don't I just <laughs> ask the group? Oh, there you go. Why don't I seek the group's intelligence on this on this topic? Well, thank you for respecting my question, and I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for asking. That's great. That's like, hey, so what's OGM's mission? Well, I think it's a multi-level marketing franchise. You know, that's... You have broken through the code so quickly, yeah, too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're going to start throwing OGM parties and selling right. OGM swag, and it'll be like a Amway scheme. That mm -hmm. seems to work for other people. Yep. Uh, we're going to call it... Um, Amadoff, just like Amway meets Madoff. It's like a kind of a hybrid model. I think that could work. Um, cool. Anyone want to just uh, start us start us rolling down this uh, slightly reflective call, and, and you can start any place you like. Anyone? Thoughts about OGM? If you want a um, beginner's mind perspective, since I, you know, I'm, I'm really new to the group and I can tell you what it appears to me as, as someone that's just dropped in from the outside. That sounds great. So, so there appears to be some type of a Silicon Valley epicenter or origin or something, maybe at some point or... Or Jerry, maybe you connected with someone there, or a group there, or a, you know, one or two people that had other that drew in others. But anyway, there seems to be kind of some sort of a, a Bay Area a hub of some sort, and um, it seems to me there's a, also some sort of a tech um, like origin, like people that are involved in information technology and that kind of thing. Um, I heard you tell me something about COVID that maybe there was some sort of a impetus that that maybe I don't know, like maybe COVID had some role in in drawing the group together online versus a different way they may have been together. But um, yeah, and then and then aside from that, it seems like just kind of like a think tanky group that enjoys, you know. Um, uh talking to each other about collective intelligence and because i'm trying to draw this back to open global mind what drew me to it was the open mind part um but but um i i thought it was kind of a consortium of pe of really open-minded <laughs> really open-minded people that that wanted to share perspectives on 
on the world, but maybe particularly with a with a technology and information um, curating bent. I'll stop there. That's a, a lovely first take. Um, and um, thank you for that, John. I will fill in a little bit of OGM history, um, which does connect with COVID because OGM started a couple months into lockdown. Um, maybe I think our first call was June 2020. And uh, a friend had introduced me to Matt Saia, who is the founder of a consultancy in Boston, which does experience design and a bunch of other interesting things. And he and I just got to talking, uh, kind of three of us got to talking uh, a couple for a couple weeks. And some of the ideas that I had around design from trust and open global mind and all that, actually open global mind didn't show up as a, as a phrase yet, but I was describing this, this thing I'm working on called uh, design from trust. And uh, Matt was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe we'd like to implement that for our company. And then, and then we thought, um, well, why don't we bring our communities together and just start a call? We're in lockdown. Things are going to be, um, we're probably going to be here for a while. So let's see what happens. And in the back of my mind, I had several years earlier, I had bought the domain openglobalmind.com and I think .org also, because I was always thinking, what would an open source collaborative version of the brain look like uh, that wouldn't force everybody to use the brain, but rather would respect everybody's personal preferences for some interesting way to model what they knew, but what would it look like to share what we know and create some kind of collective intelligence? And I offered up the name and Matt was like, that sounds great. So we, uh, we basically uh, used that name and domain as the, the, the irritant in the oyster or the, the seed of this community. And then we both invited a whole mess of people and my people tend toward uh, Silicon Valley techie, as you said, John. Uh, um, I used to be a tech industry trends analyst. So a lot of my friends uh, are from the, those communities. And there's definitely a, a sort of a, a tech bent to, to what we talk about. Uh, and I happen to really like the double entendre in open global mind about uh, the global mind and the open mindedness. Uh, <clears throat> I think we lean pretty left, pretty progressive, although I will not say that everybody who joins these conversations is a, is a lefty, but I think we, we definitely bend that way. And given the electoral cycle that just happened in some of our conversations, I'm like, how can we, how can we increase our open-mindedness is on my mind. How do we, how do we become, how do we step into that part of our, of our naming in some sense? Uh, and you could say that our conversations are think tanky or salani or something like that. We try, we have several sub calls. Uh, so I host four OGM related calls every week. <clears throat> um, this one, uh, which is kind of the heartbeat call, but then also Free Jury's Brain, Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific, Neo Books, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific. It, it got moved a little later uh, from the morning so we could accommodate uh, Jax in, uh, in Australia, who's been joining regularly. And then the uh, Fellowship of the Link on Wednesdays at 11 in the morning, which is not on Zoom, it's on Jitsi. And it's very funny, it's a little bit like Get Smart, and the cone of silence. We always have some trouble with the uh, the infrastructure, but it seems to work okay. Uh, that's a little bit of the historic part of it. And I'd love any other um, thoughts or how, how anybody connected to this, how this meshes with your ideas about why we're here, whoever would like to jump in. Can I just- Please, Alex. Uh, yeah, contribute to this. Uh, thank you for accepting me in this. Um, I have to say, I, I met Gil, and he, we, we spoke for a long time over many sessions, and he, he actually added me to the list. And I have to say, I've, I'm in the UK. I feel totally foreign to you guys. However, that's how I feel, you know. However, I appreciate the totally different thinking. I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm out of everything, really. And that's why I'm here. And it's, it is community, but... You're a lot more community than than where I am at the moment. And I hope I can carry on kind of being here um, because a lot of the time you talk about things that are very US centric and perhaps not so, but I like that you talk community. Yeah, you said that you're overly left or slightly left leaning, but that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. You know, I like to listen to all points of view. I, I put myself more in the center than left or right, but you know, 
and I hope I can carry on. But by all means, if you think I'm not contributing enough or whatever, ask me, and I'll <laughs> I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> Um, Alex, thank you. Uh, there, there is no quota for contributing. If somebody just wants to lurk uh, and hang out with us, that's totally cool. Um, whoever shows up is who is kind of meant to be in these conversations. And I'm, I'm glad they're serving something for you in, in the sense of um, creating spaces to think about or talk about things that you don't normally normally see. That I, that warms my heart. Uh, and, and you're here because of Gil and Alistair's here because of Ken. I think Alistair met Ken and Ken said, hey, come join us. And uh, and uh, now, now you're in our in our merry little band. Um, anyone else with reflections on OGM? Any any part of the story for you? Yeah, so I joined when we first started, and I actually got invited. So Gene Ballinger, um, who said this may be a group that you're interested in, and um, so what what really attracted me is this uh, systems thinking approach right so because i got really drawn into the systems thinking network that she uh, has has uh, started on linkedin really you know um and uh and you know as it happens in in our discussions we sort of follow what's happening in the world around us, right? And it's changing so darn fast. I mean, when we started, there was no AI, right? And then all of a sudden, the AI pops up and, you know, Pete comes out and why don't we, you know, get involved here and form a beta team. And so so there, there was, there has always been, we have always been lurking at the edge of where is this thing going, right? In order to stay informed and in order to, uh, to go with it. And so in in my world, because I'm uh, spending most of my time in food and agriculture, on and working with a whole group of NGOs and so on. And and uh, um, the 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 developments, you know, as as they unfold are just are just stunning. And I mean we all look at this abyss in front of us called climate change or you know, environmental degradation and think, oh my God, where are we going? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And how can I uh, insert myself here in some form and shape and make a difference? So, and I think a lot of members here are very passionate about this in their own in their own bucket, right? Everybody is is pushing uh, as hard as 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 one can, given you know, the resources and and talents that. Uh, uh, that we individually have available. So, and and so there is this encouragement, you know. And and I must say, I wouldn't be in AI if it wasn't for OGM. You know, um, I wouldn't have written neo books <laughs> if if it wasn't for Jerry to you know, come up with this idea and a, a whole group helping me with the first book uh, to you know to you know sort this, uh, bring some logic into it and and coherence. So, so there is there is that you know. So the the uh, um, this may be uh, this may be a, a lot to say, but it's like our Bible study, right? It's just you know, we just have uh, <laughs> we don't use we don't use that, but it's you now. I mean, we we have these excursions into philosophy and. You know where I mean, Ken just published. You know the the, the uh, a couple of books that uh, are really sort of path breaking, where showing us where we're going. Right? I mean, thinking about the terrestrial, thinking about global, particularly in view of this election, because this election has changed the world again. Right? I mean, the entire environment has just gone from here. Boom, that's been reset now, and. Uh, it's it's challenging to stay up with it and 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 remain constructive, positive, you know, and and not not retreat and 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 uh, uh, become become useless because you you may be all negative, right? And so, uh, I mean, I'm using my influence, uh, for example, within the Sierra Club to say, hey guys, this is great, you know, bring Kennedy in here. Oh my gosh! You know we can we can roll up the system if uh, if he really gets placed uh, into it, and it's happening. I mean the entire NGO world is is zeroing in on you know this may be good news in a bad package. You know? 
Um, so it's that thing. So, so just maintain positivity, stay at the cutting edge of uh, lurk on, at the edge of where may this thing be going? You know, and I think that's what we are doing uh, in, in supporting each other. Thanks, Klaus. Judy, you'll have to unmute, however. <laughs> Apologies for un not unmuting sooner. Um, great discussion, as always. My background is chemistry, PhD, uh, 30 years of corporate life, and retired for a fair number doing nonprofit work. And I first met Jerry over 20 years ago when he was a consultant for the American Chemical Society. Um, and was part of the Yeet Han group, which morphed ultimately into OGM. What I really value about OGM is the depth of knowledge and individual uh, values systems within the group as a whole and the differences within the group ranging from uh, quite liberal to moderate to a few that are somewhat conservative. And I wouldn't characterize the group as overly liberal. I think we're very seriously thoughtful and so most of us, I'm an independent because I'm sort of fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Um, and I suspect that many others in the group are in that spread. And I don't think we should worry too much about our orientation in that regard, because the content of the current work and thoughts of the group are so rich that it's really quite valuable to me. Um, I, I like what we're now doing. I like the focus on topics so we can prepare a little bit in our thought process. But I do really like the check-ins, which are just a chance to kind of catch up with people and see how they're doing. Thanks, Judy. Same here. Same here. Other thoughts? Other um... Mark? Mark, your video is off. Oh, there you go. You got the unmute. And I'm being silent for allowing Judy's words to sink in. Oh, thank you. All right. Now, I will start the video. All right. Last, um, let me change the video settings here. Uh, too difficult at the moment. We can see so, it. Yeah. Um, I've been through a lot of trauma. I'm a survivor. And I noticed that Scott was triggered. And Scott's my friend. Even though I've never met him in person. In the last meeting, Scott was triggered. He had to leave because of what I said. Now, that's happened several times. I'm learning from that. We're all learning from that. Now, I'm a candidate member of Maker Farm in Alameda. And there's chickens and there's goats. And I'm hoping to connect them with Microsoft, with this group, with Klaus. Because they're doing sustainable stuff. But they're a baby farm at the moment. They're, not, they're very, very disorganized. And I'm a professional organizer. And I'm going to do it for free. I'm not going to charge them. Because I'm going to benefit from getting a 8 by 20 container for 300 bucks a month. And I can have an office and a studio again outside my home. So my home isn't a mess and I'm not so stressed out. That's my check-in. Love you all. And... I'm a best friend to many, and I'm a birthday party on Friday, November 29th, when I turn 62. Now, there's got to be a lot of work, and you can see I am tired. So I'm going to mute, turn off my video, and listen to your wonderful words. I appreciate all of you, even when we disagree especially when you disagree. I reward mistakes two, three, 15, 10,000 times. My self-created AI 
I believe everybody should build their own AI, not accept anybody else's. Just take the parts that they need, keep them secure, keep them known. I don't need AI. I'm smart, intelligent, capable, disabled, hungry, tired. But every once in a while, it gives you some help. I've asked for help here. Some people have helped me. Other people haven't. I've asked for communication, coordination. Some people have stepped up. Some people haven't. I've stepped up. And then, boom, cancer. Well, that kind of kept me from participating in many ways, as well as other traumas from the past. Healing trauma, you go through more trauma. That's what happened to Scott. He got triggered. That's not my responsibility. That's on Scott. I'm telling my life story. And if Scott... Mark, I'm not sure that's on Scott. He did the right thing. I, that's fine, I but I think for brave spaces, not safe spaces, brave spaces. I'm done. Now, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays. I wish you all safety, security, the warmth of a good hearth, fire, Hestia, the Greek goddess of home happiness, welfare, economy. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Mark. What just what would you like OGM to do or be or have or try? anybody alex i mean what we've all said what everyone has spoken so far and uh, have said is it's the different perspectives so i guess what you're asking is what you we want it to be over and above what it's been because i've got i get so many different perspectives so many topics that's the power of ogm um is that is that what you're getting at because I don't know what else <laughs> it could do. I, I think there's a bunch of different angles to this. Um, uh, we, for instance, just following what you just said, we could seek out and invite in people with very different perspectives from ours and see how that works. Or we could synthesize different perspectives and feed them back to each other, or I don't know what. But I, you know, that, that's one of many angles we might take. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Uh, I've been in OGM, I guess, for two and a half or three years, and uh, we have this conversation fairly regularly, and I always come up with the, exactly the same thing. It's something I heard somebody in OGM say maybe two years ago in one of the early conversations about that, and that's what I appreciate about the potential of OGM. I agree with things other people have said about the, the conversations of people with inquiring minds and learning more about how the world works. But uh, to address what I might like OGM to be, I'd say through conversation, OGM could be midwifing what's trying to emerge. Uh, when I heard that two years ago, it stuck with me, and that's what I'm always looking for in any kind of intelligent conversation with people. Uh, things are trying to emerge, some of them uh, good, some of them less good. Uh, some of the good ones are having trouble, and they might need an, a, a large group of intelligent people like OGM to midwife them into being. And uh, that means for me more collaboration of all kinds, uh, not just talking together, but addressing societal issues together by acting and learning as we act how the world works.
that's my contribution. I love that. Thanks, Hank. And I, I, I have that note from you from a call in 2022. From early on, I, I wrote down uh, midway thing what seems to want to emerge. That's lovely. So it's, a, it's a very nice trope for us too, I think. Mm -hmm. Doug. Doug B, rather. Um, so right where Hank left off <laughs> on the same theme, um, what comes up for me is um, there's a there's a projection, and and it's not you know unique to OGM. There's a projection in gatherings like this that I participate in <laughs> that it needs to be more than it is <laughs> as a kind of you know ever present like you know that can express as are we doing anything? Are we producing anything? You know, contributing anything, all of these sort of like um, impositions. And I sort of wonder whether we're going past the close, whether the intrinsic value is present here now, always in every meeting that's happened, that it's like time to stop chasing the carrot on the stick and look down between our hooves. Um, and so what comes up for me is um, and and there's an affordance that's you know new new on the block that I think makes it potentially realistic to actually experiment or try it. Um, but would it be possible to take the the conversations, the shares, the contributions made here, um, and ask AI to turn them into one voice? into one narrative thread. Sort of an aggregate um, synthesis. And um, to have that be sort of a living voice that's continuously evolving, continuously being elaborated, um, and to sort of, you know, try to get arms around a shift in orientation to that voice that um, teases out of it um, what are the what sort of what are the different dimensions of value in it so like one dimension could be you know inside information expertise you know Klaus sort of you know pops out of that in terms of his connection to food, agriculture, soil, and, and all of the universe around that. And, um, you know, different individuals have different centers of focus that are recurring themes over time and evolved over time, elaborated over time. And, and whether we could come up with a kind of a dimension list of the, the value threads that come out um, and with the fruits of that, um, you know, use the available, there are available apps today that would enable sort of the dissemination and broadcasting of those to the right forums, to the right places and context publications, threads, you know, um, outlets, um, based on the subject matter of them. So anyway, I'll stop there. But uh, it's it's just like how to how to how to le how to how to um, energize the propagation of the value generated here, because every conversation produces value in a bunch of different directions and facets and ways, and um, it would be great to be able to you know, synthesize and propagate that, not manpower and a lot of horsepower, because none of us have that. Um, but AI and other automation, you know, affordances, um, I think make it possible to do that, you know, behind the scenes without it being a person having to, you know, become a monk. <laughs> Trying to manually, um, you know, distill and whatever, whatever, whatever.
Like that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Has the monk thing just completely gone out of style now? I think but, they've been rendered obsolete. That's too bad. That's too bad. <laughs> it is too bad. Uh, with that, I'm complete. Thank you, Doug. Uh, what you just said makes me realize that one of the things that happens for me often all the time in OGM calls, and one of the things that makes me keep wanting to do them, is that somebody will say something and something else will snap into something I was thinking or something that got said yesterday, and then it'll crystallize just a wee little bit. And and for me, this, this little process of constant crystallization is what helps me form how I see the world and sometimes sometimes question how I see the world or go, well, wait a minute, this crystal part over here is like, like not actually, it's rubbing up against reality all wrong uh, and see where that goes. And, and then every now and then some one of us will test one of those ideas with the rest of us and we'll see how that goes. And I I, I love that process. To, to me, that's a uh, it's a process of collective discovery of some sort where we're each getting something very different from the conversation. So I'm I'm curious what what an AI would get and if an AI would arrive at any of those little moments of aha crystallization that I'm that I'm kind of describing. Uh, or if it would work out a, a different way. But we certainly, we have the transcripts of, of uh, most of our calls. I don't know how, when the transcripts started getting generated, it wouldn't go all the way back to June of twenty of 2020, but we certainly have a ton of them. Uh, we could feed them into the maw of Notebook LM or something else and, and see what happens. We could even um, cause a podcast to be created that sounds like all of us, uh, and then just listen in on ourselves and go completely meta, if that wouldn't be a little too crazy to do. Alex. Thanks. Um, I'm just lowering my hand. Does it, uh, yeah. Um, it's interesting, you mentioned AI. About a year ago, I did an AI for um, Gil and Ken for the Living Between Worlds series that they do. And so so I did all that. I'll, I'll, put, I'll link it here, but it's still working, But and I'm updating it. But um, the, the, the interesting thing about that was is that once you put a whole transcript into AI, it's kind of the standard AI, the way we use it. It's like um, through a chatbot, and you have to ask it like a search question in a way. So it answers based on what it has inside it. But it just struck me a long time ago that unless you know what's in the body of it, it's very difficult to, for, to ask an AI tell me all about this corpus. It it doesn't quite get the essence of what you're trying to say. It'll give you something. So um, I've been thinking and sort of discussing with Gil about how we actually try and eke the knowledge out of it, the, 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 the constructive part of it. Because the way the AI is at the moment, if you don't know about it and you don't ask about it, you're not going to get it for free. Okay, so, so we're in the thick of that conversation as well. Uh, so my experience is if I'm thinking about something, someone else has already solved it. So if, if maybe there's AIs out there that are doing it at the moment. Um, but I would say Notebook LM, good as it is, it generates questions. You can never be sure the questions are the most important questions. You can never be sure they're all the questions, but it's better than not having it. It's, it's, it's kind of really weird the way AI is at the moment. Uh, it's not meant to be negative. It's just that I think we need to do a bit of work and I'd love to do it. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Kevin. A session uh, with a group I'm working with, this uh, Resilient Mutual Aid Network, and we're helping to connect them to institutional funding uh, where they'll do technical assistance for the places the CDFIs are doing stuff. And they were trying to figure out a, a, a fiscal sponsor and they, came, they used an AI database, a database that was tapped into AI and their suggestions were incredibly disastrous. And I'm trying to get them to stop because it, what they will look like is carpet bagging Yankees with a plan to inflict on Southerners. And this is a land that was conquered by Yankees with a plan and it, it hasn't gone well at the historic resonances of what, and I said, look, you're missing the political capital levels 
the cultural capital, the social capital, and who has influence locally, who can help you get your job done. But the AI was sending them to places in Kentucky or places that were only doing a certain kind of subsidiary uh, uh, river focused nonprofit. And the AI, and, and they were happy with it. And it was like, if you, if you are linked to them, then you're not linked locally and people will be skeptical of you because of who you're linked to. And AI does not understand social or cultural capital. And you, you, should, you should just shut off the fucking robot is what I'm telling people. And I emailed everybody else, but the guy who loves AI to tell him, you know, people I work with really closely. It's like, if, if you make this institutional decision as you try to become real to get funding, you will be outsiders and, and uh, the historic re resonance will be of uh, bad folks from the North inflicting things on Southerners thinking that we're dumb. And, and that, that really doesn't go well, uh, but they don't even know that. I mean, AI doesn't even know what the historical uh, references are uh, doing the, the way they want to do it. I am, I am just, it's shocking how bad and ignorant AI can guide you. Um, at least there's a time-honored tradition of screwing things up the way you described, Kevin. Um, can you imagine an AI that is aware of those things and that realizes it has to earn, <laughs> that it has to earn people's trust and that realizes that there are <clears throat> cultural frames within which its actions need to be taken. It's like, could you play out a world in which I can imagine that, out? you know, I don't know if you can program it, uh, you know, cause it, it, it's stuff that takes time, you know, who's done this for 20 years here and built up the largest fiscal sponsorship practice with the folks on the margins, but they, they don't ask those questions. You know, who is, who has done the most with Latinos? That's self-help. Who has done the most with African-Americans? That's Eagle. Who has done the most, the least with anybody? M many of the people that they've had were suggested have bad reputations in town because mm -hmm. they're money that inflicts things on people. So I could imagine, I just don't know how you get it to think like that, but yeah, yeah. it would be great. Cool. Klaus? Yeah. Uh, sorry, the, Klaus, Klaus and Alex. The, uh, uh, I mean, that's where uh, training comes in. And so, the the chatbot that I have developed, you know, with the with the use of a neo book, you know, by by inserting you know, a lot of of, of uh, information and 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 practices into this, it absolutely can get to that point. But you have to train it. You know, I mean, it's it's. Uh, well, I just hit them over the nose with a wrap, rolled up paper. So that's one of the ways, <laughs> rather than letting them crap on everybody. Yeah. But it's it's totally. I mean, but they don't know the question. The, the, the fact that they're remote, they're really smart. They're they're doing logistics from someplace off in who knows Minnesota or someplace north, uh, and they and they think that they just can. It's all about logic. They, they, they the the questions on culture are not within the realm of the people running the AI. It doesn't get any smarter than you are. I mean, yeah, I know. So how do you get the, the people with cultural history to talk to these folks that don't realize that cultural history is how things get done? You know, yeah. like, who's your daddy? You know, question number one. And then, you know, what did your mama do with who? You know, I mean, just none of those questions are, are in their realm, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. What Thanks, was guys. Sunday dinner like? Um, Alex. Just a quick one. We, I kind of side, sorry, I apologize, sidetracked the conversation of how good an AI would be, but I still think Doug's suggestion is good. <laughs> what Doug was saying is good. It's just, I think maybe manual work, which is what he was suggesting we shouldn't do, might be the first step towards what Doug suggested. So I'm not against AI. I'm not against Doug's suggestion. What did Doug suggest? I, I was... Walking feeding, the dog. Feeding, feeding our conversations into an AI to see what narratives emerge. Ah. I think the thrust of it was that um, what are the key useful things that have come up in all your conversations the last four years? It would be super interesting to test this on Notebook LM, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem, yeah. I think that would be the best uh, platform to use here and, and to just run the videos through it. Now, I think... 
I, I think that Pete Kaminsky has been collecting up a bunch of our transcripts uh, because he has a routine uh, on some calls for what he does, but I'm, I'm not sure. So we should, uh, I can ask and see if he's got something handy. Because for me, I'd have to drag through a whole series of folders to go find, to collect up the, the files themselves, but it's, it's not hard. It's doable. It's just, it's probably even easily automatable. I just don't know how. Um, thanks. Judy. Well, just <clears throat> on the subject of AI, it, it seems to me that it takes me back to my early days with search engines where I didn't really trust them. And so I would search X and then I would search anti-X so that the search engines couldn't profile me and only give me what they thought I wanted to see. And I have a similar concern about AI not being at all engaged with it um, in terms of its ability to represent the diversity of perspective which has most of the richness of what we're trying to figure out. It just doesn't work if you simplify it to a single answer because the single answer is the result of four different points of view and AI might not weight them the same way I would, or I would at least want to know that there were four different points of view that led to that. So I'm displaying conspicuously my lack of technical expertise about how this actually works, but from a philosophical point of view, I really like the discussions that include richness and differences of perspective because that's where I learn. Me too. Thanks, Judy. Doug B. Yeah, I um, I don't, you know, to, to Alex's point, I don't look at AI as providing. Um, I look at it as an affordance. It's, you know, in a true Doug Engelbart, you know, augmentation of human intelligence way that it's, it's a, it's a, it's a horsepower affordance um, to automate distilling information out, you know, eliminating redundancies and finding like subject kinds and centers of subject focus and that kind of stuff. The, the part of it that would not be from AI, but on us is to explore a new way of orienting to the different types of value dimensions captured in the conversational flow. So it's almost more of a taxonomic kind of thing of, um, you know, what's information, what's political, what's social, what's relational, what's economic, what's this, what's that. It's um, really exploring whether we could evolve and develop a different orientation to that, that, that factors for exactly what Kevin raised, which is that, that provides and brings the tuning, the, um, the query design and architecture to factor for the human, to factor for the soft stuff, to factor for the relation, to factor for the connective, and, and <clears throat> it's not that those things can't be factored for and leverage AI to help surface. It's in the intelligence of the people framing the query universe that determines whether those things are, are factored and surfaced. AI is just a robot. It's a pattern matching machine on steroids. It's nothing more than that. And I don't, I don't relate to it as providing anything more than that. I just relate to it as a real time saver. Um, the, the work of stirring in the human and the living to the informational and the knowledge and the expertise domain um, and the data domain uh, is, is in the hands of the person developing the queries. And I'm complete with that. Thanks, Doug. Stacey. Yeah, just to add to that, um, and in terms of you know which comes first, 
I had a similar experience when um, Jose had run his run the transcripts of uh, Society 2045 through um, the AI. And once, once he came out with what he came out with, it gave me an opportunity to look and see, well, where where don't I really agree or where do I want to break this down even more? And that's something I would have liked to have continued. So to Doug's point about being the time saver, doing that first dump, I think is a big time saver, but then it's up to us to go in. And as Judy said, find where those different points came in and where we want to spend a little bit more time refining it. Interesting. I should say, if you're listening in on the call and you want to talk a little bit about what you did, please do, but you might have stepped away. Um, cool. If he's not available, I can I can share because oh, I was please. around for that. So he took, we had Society 2045, which was a couple of years of people sharing, individuals sharing and group discussion. And then after a two year run of those collected um, uh, gatherings, uh, Jose put them into uh, AI engine basically, and you know asked for it to distill out common themes. Because what was what what surfaced was that each person came with slightly different variations, but all had the same common driver underlying. And so uh, it ended up producing uh, sort of a rubric of, you know, eight or nine themes that were the common themes across all of the people who presented. Um, it sort of, he then synthesized that as sort of a stopping point. And, but I, I, I'm very much in, in the Stacy camp with that that was a first swipe, but really a starting point, that would be the first, that would be an initial starting place for then really exploring elaboration and, and enrichment uh, to add depth. <clears throat> and there's Jose. Jose, I hope I fairly represented your effort. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think that's what we did. I, I think we had a, a very, um, a, a much more narrowed focus. Our conversations go quite wide. The the interviews that we did, uh, the forty or so interviews that that uh, got um, reviewed through AI, were narrow in focus. In other words, what's your vision of the future within the domain that you're working in? And and because of that, what we were able to see was that. The patterns underlying what people saw in their domain were consistent. Um, and that I thought was revelatory, but also um, to, to both uh, Stacy's and Doug's point, there could be more to be done with that. The reason that we went to AI in the first place was because after months of effort of trying to get us to do it ourselves, um, we weren't getting any traction. And uh, so it was interesting that once AI came up with something, then people were more interested in, in engaging because there was something to, it wasn't just work uh, at that point, it was something to to polish, to make better, to improve. And uh, and so I think that that's an interesting thing. And that, by the way, those results, the eight points that came out, um, have been very well received by the community at large um, and the folks that were part of, of that research in the first place. Love that. Thanks. You. Do you have, uh, is there a community society 20, 2045 post about that, about the results or something like that? Can you, if you can add those to the chat, that'd be great if, if you wrote any of those up. Um, a piece of the conversation here is making me think that open global mind is not only about human minds, but it might also be about the blending of human and these artificial intelligences. And that we've done a, a little bit of talking and thinking about that, but not a whole lot. And it comes up in ways like it just has in the, in the conversation today about what is or isn't replaceable or emulatable or whatever else. 
but I, one of my, one of my beliefs is that our future is very cyborg, that we are going to be melding with software more, not less, uh, that those of us humans who value and appreciate actual human contact and trust and the things that Kevin was pointing to earlier as being essential for understanding how to intervene. Um, I don't think those skills go away. I think they get more important, but, but I think they get more important in an increasingly technological setting. Uh, and understanding one of my puzzlements around these questions is why are so many people holding up human intelligence as the benchmark and the physical human as the robot benchmark for, you know, uh, lifelike uh, uh, human robots. I'm like, uh, really, I, I don't see it because it feels to me like these intelligences are different and multiple and sometimes very narrow, but really deep uh, and sometimes uh, broad, but superficial. I don't know, but they, but they, they seem to me to be very different. And it feels like holding them up to a human benchmark is somehow limiting to what the possibilities are. So if anybody's interested, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in heading into, into that territory of how, how might our intelligences collaborate? Stacey, is your hand still up from before or do you wanna jump in? I didn't know it was up, I'm sorry. No worries. Robin, nice to see you. And uh, Ken, you're next up. So you said something early in the call, Jerry, about um, you know we tend to lean left here and how can we uh, perhaps open our open global mind a bit more to other perspectives. And, you know, I've always had trouble with left-right uh, dichotomy. Uh, I don't consider myself to lean left, although I, um, I tend to vote Democratic because I feel the Democrats better represent what I'm interested in, but they don't always have the answers. And um, I've been reading Bruno Latour's Down to Earth. I'm going to drop a notebook LM, just a three-page document into the chat here. I highly suggest people take a look at this. It's It's quite amazing. Um, he identifies uh, that the terrestrial is now a political actor. The Earth is a, is acting very, very strongly in the political field, and we're ignoring it. And uh, the modernity project of taking care of the whole world has collapsed, uh, and people are either re retreating into uh, local as a way of we're grounded in this place and we're going to steward the Earth, but. They're ignoring the uh, the other local, what he calls local minus, which is uh, exclusionary and becoming isolationist, and you know America first and blood and soil, um, and the the global project of um, uh, local minus is um, exploitation. And you know his thesis is that the elites, the billionaire class, have completely abandoned the project, and they are just taking care of themselves with what he calls out of this world. Um, solutions of uploading our consciousness to silicon or uh, silicon or colonizing mars or building gilded communities and gated communities where they will almost survive we're ignoring the terrestrial as a um as a political actor and so he suggests that we can actually move past that and there's four questions in particular that he asks that i i just want to throw in here and they are what do i care about most with whom can I live? Who depends on me for subsistence? And against whom am I going to have to fight? I think those are pretty substantial questions, very juicy, very ogm -y. And while I agree with you, Jerry, that we are going to be um, blending more and more with, with both software and hardware, we're ignoring the intelligence of other than humans. We're not I don't hear a lot of conversation on OGM about the intelligence of ecosystems, about the intelligent, the self-regulating intelligence of ecosystems. You know, if you read Lovelock, uh, if you read Guy Hypothesis and Novacine, the Earth has a very strong ability to be self-adaptive and self-regulating. And if it's heating up, so it will probably start to have a lot more volcanic activity in the next few years. Um, when we allow 70% of insects, 70% of mammals to die off. We are destroying incredible billions of years worth of intelligence. And I don't hear that as part of our conversation. I don't hear that as part of the, the mainstream conversation. And it's going to make for a future that is really bleak for those who are going to come after us. And I feel the weight of that a lot, especially since this election. My ancestors are really in an uproar. And it's very hard for me to, to sleep or, or feel restful around this. So I just want to throw those things in um, as a, you know, if we want to broaden our, our conversations beyond left and right, 
let's really look at, you know, how can we bring together people who are really concerned about the same things, but see them from different perspectives and tend to polarize and say, let's, let's look at what is in common here and what we care about and what we value and how can we approach this differently, recognizing that there is a multi, multi-billion dollar effort to disrupt us by dividing us and saying and denying climate change. You know, climate change is real, whether you like it or not. And it is impacting everybody. It's happening now. So let's cut through the bullshit and start to say, look, I don't think you're a bad person because you voted differently than me. I think you you have a different set of values that are being expressed differently politically. But underneath, we both care about having a livable world, a livable planet. So let's get to work on that. Thank you. Um, Ken, thanks. And also, I think you're mapping or describing some calls we ought to have. Uh, that we should head into the territory of uh, forget about left and right. There is a field out there where we can meet uh, and actually have some of these conversations. And there are people and groups that are doing these things. And I, maybe we should spend some time inviting them in and learning from what they're up to and uh, what works and what doesn't from from their worlds. Uh, yeah, and all my relations. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate what Ken is saying. There, there, there is really uh, there is a meta level perspective, you know, where you look at uh, you know big picture stuff, and then you have to look into the uh, different uh, segments of the economy and society to understand what is happening in your sphere. So I'm, you know, engaged with food and agriculture. So I've, I went through several uh, uh, seminars on AI application, and the, the the trend right now is to go and develop verticals, what they call verticals, meaning specialists. Um, so we, we are I'm, I'm, we are in the process of launching a company finally, and the chairman of the World Food Bank is the driver you know, of raising money. We had a, a fundraising event yesterday with the Rockefeller Foundation and Tom Steyer Foundation and, and uh, uh, you know, several other groups there who are engaged. Cisco was at the table, PepsiCo was at the table because there is a real understanding now that we do have to change and that agriculture is at the forefront of what we can actually influence within uh, a, a reasonable time span, right? Because if you change agriculture at scale, you can really impact the hydrologic cycles, biodiversity, you know, uh, uh, nutrient density in the soil, and so on and so on. So, so the 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 idea of what we have is to create a, a an innovations brokerage that connects from farm to market. So there are four work streams. One is the farm. One is markets. One is logistics to connect farm with market. And then one is admin to provide guidance and orientation to make this all work. And we found a platform in Britain, it's called Hivebright. Uh, they're in the process of integrating AI into the platform. That means people can find each other within the platform. So if I'm a farmer and I need a seed core who has whatever uh, type of specialty seed that I want, that that uh, uh, is a recommendation for me to use to put to restore my soil. I can find that seed on this platform because because the the way the the system will be formatted, you know, will will facilitate that. And and then we have developed. I mean, I have developed an AI capacity that's called a TSP support assistant. That's a technical service provider support assistant that will help someone who wants to become uh, certified to work for USDA as a subcontractor, uh, where to apply, uh, what he needs to know or she needs to know, um, and go through the entire certification process. And then once certified, that, that uh, 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 GPT can do farm assessment. So it has already developed a questionnaire of what it needs to know to do a farm-specific assessment and then develop a five-year plan for that farmer to regenerate his or her soil back to life. Um, then we can package this and put it on the carbon markets and generate carbon credits you know, that will then finance or, or create a revenue stream for this farmer. All of that you know, is, is AI-driven. 
uh, I can literally go to to this AI and say, write me uh, 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 a questionnaire for a farm assessments. What do you need to know, you know, to to make a a a competent assessment on a farm? And it writes me this questionnaire that of what it needs to know. So that's where AI is drifting in an application sense, you know, in a very practical, uh, useful way. But in order to get there, you have to train this thing. You know? I mean, so, so I uh, put in, for example, links to USDA, to their service programs, their training, you know, the, the uh, certification uh, uh, requirements that they need and so on. So, so from that standpoint, you're getting a coworker the only way this really this really helps is if you use it as an amplification to your own skill. That means I I I know that it needs to have a questionnaire uh, that that gives it a farm specific assessment. It wouldn't come up with that on its own. Oh dear. Well, Kevin, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going on too long? But it, it's it's it's. It's it's that's where where uh, AI can become really useful. That's really exciting, actually. The robot doesn't have to stay stupid. Yeah, uh, and the more we can inform the robot about what we're looking for and what the nuances of the situation are, I think the better the advice gets. But it is it is an amplifier, uh, and it'll amplify stupidity just as easily as as uh, intelligence. Totally. Uh, Mr. Carranza. Mark, if you're there, your hand is up. You might have just stepped away. Um, go ahead, Alex. Just quickly. Actually, sorry. Uh, um, as a UX de designer, developer, I use five different computers, three different phones. I try to avoid Apple at all costs. God, I hate Apple. Now, but I learned from Apple. Apple is right brain and left brain in a different way than I think, because I grew up with Microsoft and DOS, and Linux, and Unix, where little pieces get put together, and I can interchange them and make a pizza, or a factory from the same ingredients. Farm to table, table to mouth, mouth to toilet, toilet to farm, closed loop, fusion, recycle, reuse, repeat. Rinse. Dr. Bronner's wisdom. Now, um, hopefully, I can calmly show the books that are very thick. This is Animal Communication. It is about how animals communicate without words. We use words. We swim in words. We are fishes in a sea of language and symbols. Now, animals use symbols. They build nests. They point. They have alarm signals. Crows are incredibly intelligent. The monkeys escaped, and they're loose, because that's exactly who Trump is, the leader of the monkeys. They're running all over, causing chaos. And they say they want order. No, they're testing the boundaries. They're testing our boundaries. Now, I'm going to sue Donald Trump for Trump derangement syndrome. He's caused chaos in my life. I'm suing that guy. Now, I'm the resistance. I am an underground of one. But, Klaus, I love what you're doing. Hire me. I will work my ass off for you. Now, You've never heard of Gustav Eckstein. The body has a head. I would read you from that at random, but no, you can look it up yourself. Save me the trouble and the time of this precious meeting. I will repeat 
Terry Deacon. Terry Deacon, Terry Deacon. What I say three times is true. What I say four times is emphasized. That's mind Kampf. That's mind control. That's hypnosis. That's what they know your brain better than you know your brain. And I'm not standing for it. I know my brain better than any AI. I know my life better than any doctor or OGM. If I'm pissing you off, I'm creating confusion and you are reacting. And that's me controlling you or influencing you or advising you. I don't know. It's in the interface that is alive itself. That's communication. Communication is alive. Words are alive. Plants are alive. Mycelium communicates between trees, insects, and the fungus among us. That's what we learned from Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry learned that from other people. Our words are not our own. We inherit words. We are inculcated by our parents. Language is a virus from outer space, says William Burroughs. And Laurie Anderson agrees. Now, I agree with Doug. I agree with Sam. I agree with Hank. I agree with uh, Alistair. I write poems not waiting for Ken to read his poem. I just throw them out there in the chat. Now, some people disagree with the way I act, the way I think. That's incredible. That's diversity. Thank you for listening. Now, rest. Turn off my video and listen to your great words, your wisdom. You are each gods, each of you, of yourselves, but not anybody else. And nobody's God is God over me. Thank you. Now, Mark. happy Thursday. Thank you. Um, I, it's very, I, I feel like you are our own chaos agent uh, in the room and that you are slamming things around on the walls for us in ways that we may find irritating, may not be considering, may whatever. But uh, but thank you. And uh, I know you've, you've been having a hard time for a while and um, I'm happy that we can Figure something out here. Um, Alex, I think you were... Uh, Wrapping were gifts. Putting things in the mail. Birthday invitations. Friends in crisis. Helping a disabled person this morning. Uh, making a run to uh, uh, the neighborhood stores for him. I did a lot today. Now, I'm applying for Maker Farm. Mark? And I'm writing a whole bunch of documentation, first aid kit, etc. I'm an Eagle Scout. I know for state. Take care. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, if you can put the the author of that animal communications book in the chat, I'd appreciate it because um, searching on Amazon for animal communication comes up with a whole load of books. I none have of the which, same problem. None of which seem to be as academic as the book you held up there. Um, what I want to say was just something else uh, is that there's, so many, there's a number of us who know or do or practice or whatever it is with AI. And I know Pete runs the AI group. Let's call it that. I'm not sure beyond that what it is. But um, if anybody's interested, I, I talk about AI to friends, family, my meetup groups, people that code AI. If anybody wants a free intro to AI or whatever, for as long as you want it, um, I'm happy, and I'm sure there'll be others in the group that would be able to do the same. But I'm, I'm, I'll offer as well. So, just connect to me through whatever means you have. Thank you. Um, we've got 20 minutes left in this call. Uh, any wishes for OGM? Any things you would like to see us try or do? 
I actually just got my wish with Alex's offer. I have always wished that this would be a place where people say, here's what I have to offer if anybody wants it. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, Alex. So close. <laughs> cool, thank you. I see the book is in the edited by bio. Okay. Alistair, go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, one reason why I joined the uh, ODM is because I'm looking for meaningful conversations and uh, yeah, with some variety of points of view, although I'm left for myself. Uh, and um, and especially where there's uh, some space for people to talk about uh, their emotions. Uh, now, of course, there are bad ways to bring emotions into a discussion and good ways. Um, so I'm hoping that we can find good ways, you know, to, to do that. Uh, I certainly, uh, I think uh, one small way of doing that is uh, what uh, Jill Friend uh, was talking about moves, you know, so we can uh, do a bit of that, you know, like talk about uh, our moves, I think that could be helpful. So that's, that's basically what I'm saying. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Robin, you're doing um, some work recently. I'm just totally spacing on the title of the book that um, that you had referenced that you're doing some work around, uh, like yep. <clears throat> Meg Wheatley's uh, yeah. book, Who Do We Choose to Be? Thank you. Um, I know a lot of people on this call have, have read it or are interested, and the question that keeps really tugging at me is, if we are at a point as a species where some of the things that we hoped would change and that we could affect um, are kind of beyond the the point <laughs> of of being brought back into health, um, what how do we maintain our motivation and what is the purpose of our work? And she offers the concept of islands of sanity and 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 working, you know, very locally and intentionally uh, within our sphere of control. And so I'm hoping to convene a, a group of interested folks who, you know, hopefully don't want to talk about exclusively anyway the the you know why it's too late and if it's too late and should you have hope or should you not have hope because I don't want to focus there but I do want to focus on um, what does it mean to be of uh, service at this particular time um, and how can we be in greater community with one another um, in ways that enrich us collectively. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that too. When you're a farmer, you know that death has a meaning. When you're a hunter, you know that death has a meaning. Now, do I kill for food? I have. Do I kill mice in the house? I have. In good ways. But I've also set humane traps and let them go about four blocks away into um, you know, community garden. And it's just kind of a matter of coordination and what I have at hand and what the need is. Do I feel terrible about killing a rat or a mouse? Hell yes. About a fly? Not as much. About a human? 
No human should ever kill another human. No hobbit has ever killed another hobbit in the imagination of J.R.R. Tolkien. I want my legacy to be a peaceful planet. And I'm damn straight about that. I do not want war. I do not want murder. I do not want the death penalty. And I want a woman to choose whether a group of 500,000 cells or 16 billion cells is viable or not for her family. I want the husband to have a choice, the father to have a choice, but the father has a choice not to have sex. Mark, I'm adamant this about is, that. Marcus, this is Robin. Um, I I would uh, uh, just respectfully like to ask what what are you reading from something? Or I'm not sure what we're doing here with this. What I'm doing is basically um, talking about a life story, about 62 years of wisdom. I've got a birthday coming up. I've been through cancer. It changed me. I'm not the person I was six years ago. And I'm glad for that. But boy, has it been a struggle. Can you learn from my struggle? Is my struggle triggering you? I am in conversation with all of you and with all of the people and identities and roles that I play all at the same time. I could be in conversation with the AI. We could have the AI join in on this conversation. You want me to help do that? I will. We can have one zoom thing for a live ai responding to us raising its hand being quiet showing videos i can do that hell yeah i know how it just takes time effort money and i'm tired and after the holidays i'll be happy to do that but now i want all of you to have a peaceful safe joyous warm family holiday and you're all invited to my birthday party 1436 8th avenue please edit that out for the public <laughs> for the public uh uh consumption um, um mark yeah um i i count on you to self-regulate how much you participate in these calls i'm really happy for us to be here and you've wished us peace and stepped out of the conversation three times that i've counted I need you to honor the spirit of the space and let us be here to hold you, but not to send us in spinning circles so often. Does that make sense? It does. I'm sorry. I am lack of sleep. Again. So don't don't is... don't play it out on us, please. Sure. You're not my therapist, but I'm trying to impart advice and suggestions from hard learned lessons where I've fallen down or been hurt or been attacked. Understand. Now, I was responding to what Robin had said. Although I could have chosen to either chat or not respond. Just be silent. Now, because we're at the closing of this meeting, I will not talk again. And I will not show my video again. Agreed? Thanks. Um, Robin, thanks for asking that, that question. Anybody with any Closing thoughts on the call. Very thought provoking. Thanks, Judy. I'd like to ask all the non AIs in the room what we're taking away from this call. What have we learned here? Let's not run it through an AI, let's run it through our brains. Oh, God, I've forgotten how to do that. 
<laughs> Try your other brain, Jerry. You got two of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll jump in and just say that what I love most is the renewed appreciation for diversity of perspective. Thank you. Anyone else? What have we learned from this call? What is our wetware absorbed? I'm feeling a very particular, sharp, poignant respect for or awareness of how different the places we're coming from can be. Stacey? This wasn't so much what I learned from the call, but what I wanted to share. That's okay? Yeah, please. Um, so what really became clear for me, it, 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 I was reminded that one of the very first spiritual lessons I learned was to wait to be asked and ask for what you want to hear and then wait for the answer, both. You know, it's like a balancing act between listening and speaking and hearing. And I know for me personally, I want to know what it is people want to hear from me before I tell them. And I think a lot, I, I think it's an interesting question to ask ourselves why we say what we do, what we're hoping for, what we want the listener to get from it. And I think that we're not really, when I say we, most of us or generally or usually, we're not always as good as we could be at really balancing out what the space needs and what my personal needs are and what the people around me are. And I think, you know, it, it's a group effort and I think honesty helps, you know, because, it, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to say that there's some, there's more to be learned about listening. Thanks, Stacey. Anyone else? Yeah, Jerry, just John. Um, I just want to jump in and uh, express my appreciation for you. I, I, I just find you a really respectful person, which I really value. And um, I mean, it all started with you respecting my question and you, you know, you conducted this entire uh, session around it. Um, and so what I got from this session was a very rich, deep, answer to my question. Uh, really appreciate it, uh, but also just appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. Well, Sam. Oh, sorry about the noise in the background here, but um, yeah, just to just to go off what John was saying there, um, like one of these sort of truisms that I've been pondering is like the strength of a, of a of a government or a governance system is its ability to hold um like the the how do we say this the i forget there's some way that somebody said this better than i'm going to say it but this the strength like the the um the, the you know the magic of a good governance system is its ability to hold uh, the measure of a good governance system is its ability to hold diverse perspectives like the more diverse perspectives it can hold you know the more like magical it is or the more like useful it is or the more helpful or the more you know and the more um it will promote the advancement of its people and the development of new you know technologies or new ways of doing things and all that kind of stuff like the benefits of collaborative process so um and so this is like a compliment to you jerry that that this is like you're the uh the glue that holds this together and um and you're able to kind of manage a lot of different ideas and a lot of different, you know, neurotypias and et cetera. So, um, and uh, you do it with a certain grace and um, and that's always kind of interesting and fun to to watch, to be part of in and of itself. So um, yeah, so that's part of what I get out of this and also, you know, just interesting hearing all these different perspectives and yeah. Thank you, Sam, very much. Um, Ken, might it be time to go to a poem if you've got one for us? 
I do, I just was noticing Robin's question in the chat. This is a question we've asked ourselves many times. Um, yes. and, uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon, I have invited many people to this call. I've invited many women to this call and they show up for one or two calls and they leave. And, um, I think it's a, it's a very challenging place. It's very highly intellectual. It's white male dominated. It's not always friendly to women. Um, and you know, so I I would actually shift the thing to what can we as as white guys do to be more friendly towards them and make this a more welcoming space? Because I have this feeling that maybe unconsciously we're not creating a welcoming space because we've had women show up and then leave, and there hasn't been a follow up of why did you why were you here for two or three calls and you don't come anymore? Right? Um, it would be incumbent upon us to find that out. I think so. That's that's a, a thought about that, Robin. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, I would probably count myself among the those women who are kind of on the fence. This is probably my second or third. I think it's my third meeting. And I find myself trying to get a foothold into the conversation. Um, and it's not because it's too intellectual for me. I do have a PhD. But um, it's, it's because I don't necessarily one know exactly what we're doing together. Are we are we are we demonstrating our knowledge? Are we are we lecturing to each other? What are we trying to accomplish? Because I'd like to be in community with you know amazing uh, you know thinkers and doers in the world, uh, but I don't get a sense that um, this that from the calls that we feel like anything is missing. And it seems really clear to me that there, there is, there, there are perspectives that are missing here. Thank so you. I'm just, you know, wondering, do, do, what do we, what kind of container is this? Because I think that may be why um, there are less women participating here. Okay. I'm going on mute. Uh, Robin, thank you. And we've we've dived into that question multiple times, and we're painfully aware of it. Um, and I'd love to know better what what it is we do or don't do that that would work better. I, I I find it disingenuous to ask people who don't look like my demographic to show up in my conversation because we want more diversity. I think that's just totally not a way to go about it at all. I think that we need to. Uh, possibly, quite possibly serve people who don't look like us and see if that helps. Uh, but I'm open to all kinds of other suggestions. So please, um, it, wherever, uh, write me directly, write, ask the question on the OGM list. Uh, we can, again, have calls about it uh, here as a topic. Alex. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Robin, for this. It's something I notice in every group I go to predominantly white, predominantly older, predominantly um, not female. <laughs> and it's really weird because, I mean, I ask my wife, I say, I say to her, this is interesting, why don't you join up? And she says, oh, uh, I can read a book or watch TV or whatever. I, I don't know what it is, but, but all I would say is we're not unique. And I suppose the only meetup or whatever that, that you get in women is coding for women. I suppose women turn up for those. Not being a woman, I haven't turned up for that. So, um, but it's really amazing that it's not just women. It's like, I don't know what it is we white males do that put off everybody else. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> we must be doing something. <laughs> Sorry. Something's going on. Um, Alistair. Um, first of all, scientific question, I think it would be best to of the uh, the woman who did join for a, a quarter or two and then uh, didn't continue, you know, uh, for their perspective on what they don't like or what's keeping them from uh, joining the course again. And I don't know, uh, I mean, just like, it's not maybe, maybe we can't articulate uh, what draws us to, to this group. Uh, maybe they won't be able to articulate what, uh, repels them all, but it's better than uh, us, you know, just speculating. It's worth asking, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
and maybe you and I or Klaus, sort of old hands on the call, can think about uh, women who've come and gone, and I, I, I can ping them and see if they'd like to chat or whatever. That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, Judy. I just think part of it is that, you know, a predictable call, this is not a predictable call. It's predictable in its unpredictability, which attracts me greatly. Um, but that may not be what rings other people's bell. And people seem reluctant to make recurring commitments as well. I'm noticing it across all the organizations that I'm in. Uh, volunteerism and participation is waning a bit. And so I think the disorder of the universe is individually affecting people and their willingness to participate. And I suspect that the women view themselves as having to hold it together in a family sense, whatever they define their family to be. And I don't mean only biological, which then means that they're, they're sitting in a ponderous space <laughs> and that might inhibit them joining a new group. I think the right way to invite them in is one at a time and maybe another woman saying, I don't know whether you'd enjoy this group, but I find it intriguing because. <laughs> um, and I think that would be one approach we could try. Thank you. Uh, Doug B. So uh, <clears throat> I actually asked this question <clears throat> and got some really interesting answers. Um, and sort of at the top of the hit parade, um, it was, um, I, I'm gonna frame it elementally just because it's easier. Um, earth and water, which is earth is safety and foundation and receiving and holding, nurturing, and water, which is movement and life are both feminine uh, divine feminine elements. They're rooted in magnetism. Um, fire and air. Fire is the act of metabolism, transformation, doing energy, and air is intellectual, abstract, clarity of view, but no emotion, no feeling, are the masculine divine energies. They're electrical. And <clears throat> the the white male phenomena is these rooms are all fire and air. Um, it's that, you know, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? What do we have to do? Which is the fire stuff and and air, the intellectual, like framing, framing, researching data, grounding, objective stuff. And um, the women that I spoke to, the real bottom line was they found the exercise sort of barren and boring. Nothing was being grown out of the conversations. And for lack of there being a living dimension, um, it was boring. And, you know, uh, their chair was moving on to places where they felt more vitality. Um, I have somehow ended up in terms of most of my sort of client base these days, the organizations and individuals and people that I'm working with uh, are predominantly women. And the energy and orientation, the dynamic and the feel of when we meet and when we engage and discuss is just qualitatively completely different. And I find it, <clears throat> vastly more balanced between the objective and the data and the, the intellectual and the emotional sense and feel and the air, the vibe, the space, the, the nature of the interactions are much softer, are much more spacious, are much more inviting and holding on a, on a sentient level, on an emotional experiential level. And so it's, it's, that's qualitative. So I, I just offer that, you know, uh, for what value it, it may hold for you. Uh, and with that, I'm complete. Doug, thank you. 
Uh, Ken, thanks for taking us into that cycle. It was Robin, don't don't yeah. credit me. <laughs> well, um, you you sort of brought us back into it when I was just uh, not heading there. So thanks. Yeah. So um, I'll invite another woman in, Maya Angelou, alone, okay. lying, thinking last night, how to find my soul a home, where water is not thirsty, and a bread loaf is not stone. I came up with one thing. And I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. There are some billionaires with money they can't use. Their wives run around like banshees. Their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone, but nobody no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. The storm clouds are a gathering. The wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering, and I can hear the moan. Because nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. And thank you. You have a gift for locating poems that in the spot. Glad I have some gift. <laughs> you have many gifts, but that's one of them. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Are we meeting next week on Thanksgiving? So I am on the road for, for the next three weeks. I'm suggesting we skip next Thursday. That sounds like a good idea since it's Thanksgiving morning. Uh, so okay. let's just have, take a pass next week and we'll figure out what to do the week after. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.